We're nearly done with this first unit, which is an introduction to R and, and to statistical programming. Uh, and really, this is the last one that I feel gets deep into the language because the very last one is about plotting and visualizations. It doesn't feel quite as complicated or uh, doesn't feel quite as much as, as programming. Uh, so after this one, uh, I don't think that you'll know everything there is to know about R. You definitely won't. But I think your foundation will be strong enough that you can pick up whatever else you need to on your own. All right, we'll start this one with conditional execution. Uh, sometimes there's code that you don't always want to run, but only under a certain circumstance, only if some condition is met. Uh, and the basic way to implement this is with an if statement. An if statement has two parts. There's a logical variable, and then there's the body of the statement. So the logical variable is either going to be true or false, and the body of the statement will be run if that variable ends up being true. Uh, if it ends up being false, it will just be skipped. So let's take a look at an example. So built into R, there's a function sys.time, which from the computer will get the current date and time. And so we can see, you know, it's a little bit after noon Eastern time on uh, 23rd of May, 2022. Well, I'm using the format function to pull out just the hour of that. So the hour is 12, it's a little bit afternoon. You'll notice the quotation mark. So that's a character right now. I pass it into as not numeric. And so now it just sees it as the number 12. And I'll save that as the current hour. Well, I've got actually a, a compound logical variable in here. I wanna check one of two things. If the hour is greater than 22, so if it's late at night, this would be after 10 p.m. Uh, or if the hour is less than or equal to six, so it's before 6 a.m. This means I'm basically working at night, right? At, at, at night almost the middle of the night. And so if either one of these is true, the compound statement will evaluate the true. Then we'll print out the statement. It's late, Steve, stop working, go to bed. Your family is worried about you. So let me actually try running the if statement. And it didn't print anything because it's not nighttime, right? It's middle of the day. We don't satisfy that condition. Uh, and that piece of code is skipped over. Sometimes there's an alternate segment of code that you want to run if the condition is not met. Uh, if that's the case, add an else statement onto the end of your if. And if your condition is true, it runs what's in the if. Otherwise, it'll run what's in the elf, else. So here's the uh, template for that. So if the variable is true, there's where you would put the code to run when it's true. Otherwise, it'll run uh, the second statement inside the else. So in my research area, uh, which is reinforcement learning, um, it's often the case that we want to usually do what we call exploitation, which is using your current knowledge to make as good of a decision as you can. But sometimes, randomly, you want to explore. You want to try something you haven't tried before to see if it's better uh, than what you think is best right now. So I could run code somewhat like this. Now let's take a look at the logical variable. It starts with a uniform random number, just one of them between zero and one. And every time I run this, it's gonna be randomly generated. So I'll get something different each time. If that random number is less than 0.9, which is gonna be true about 90% of the time. So let's check this. Yeah, I can see most of the time that evaluates to true, but eventually about 10% chance, it'll evaluate to false. Well, if it's true, then I could put in some code that would run the exploitation uh, part of the reinforcement learning algorithm. And then otherwise it would run the code that does the exploration part. And so as placeholders, I've just put a print statement that tells me whether it's exploiting or exploring. So if I highlight this whole thing and run it repeatedly, most of the time it's gonna say exploiting, 90% of the time, but eventually if I keep on going, it's taking a little while. Now I'm starting to feel unlucky. Now I'm starting to doubt myself. I, oh, there it is. Okay, good. I thought I made a mistake in the code. Yeah, eventually that'll uh, evaluate to false, uh, the logical variable. And then we get what's inside the else statement. If you have not just two alternatives that you wanna choose from, but a longer list of alternatives, then you can keep chaining else and if statements together. So I use something kind of like this. Whenever I'm assigning course grades at the end of the semester, uh, there'll be a course average. 
And then I'll go from the, the best other grades down to the worst. If that course average is greater than or equal to 90, well, that student gets an A. If I haven't satisfied the first condition, so it's less than 90, but it's greater than 80, now I know I'm between 80 and 90, and they get a B. And if that's not true, but it's greater than 70, you're in the C range, and so on and so on. Notice at the end, I have an else uh, without a matching if. So if I haven't satisfied any of the other conditions, their grade is below 60 and they get an F. So let's test this out. I'll define the course average. I'll run that. And let me actually check and see what the letter grade is. Yeah, for a person who got a 55, that's an F. Let's say that somebody else gets a 92. I run that. Now it comes back as A. All right, well, I think that's kind of neat. And on one hand, I do like uh, the structure of that. It's kind of pleasing to look at, um, but it's also a little bit unwieldy. And if the, the code inside the body of the if statements is complicated, this can start to get really big and be difficult. Uh, so something else that you can use is a switch statement. I don't actually use these very much, uh, but I'll give you a couple of examples. The way it works is you give it an input, which can either be a number or a character. Um, and then you give it a list of alternatives. So code that you want to run depending on what uh, value the input takes. So start with a simple example. I'm going to input a two into this. And then my alternatives are apple, banana, and cantaloupe. So basically, whichever number I put in, it's gonna give me back that corresponding fruit. This should return banana. And sure enough, it does. If I had input a one instead, it'll execute apple and give that back. And of course, three will give uh, the last one. So I wondered if I could use something like that to write a shorter statement to assign letter grades. And I'm gonna end up changing this example because this doesn't work great. It works for some. So let me try 70 here. What I'm having it do is I'm, uh, I'm getting the quotient after I divide by 10. So 70 divided by 10 is uh, seven. I'm not worried about the remainder. I just wanna know kind of what's in the, the tens digit there. And then I've got F, 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 D, C, B, A. So this should pick out the uh, seventh one of these. Okay, and that person just barely made a C. If they had made, let's say an 85 instead, well now what's actually being input into the switch statement is an eight, it'll pick out the eighth entry and that person gets a B. So I was feeling very clever after I came up with this, but then I realized, what if I do something like this? What if somebody got everything right plus a bonus? What if their course average is uh, 105? Does that work? No, that actually doesn't because I don't have a, a tenth entry in this. And similarly, if, if somebody has a super low grade, let's say they only got 6% of the course credit, uh, the quotient is zero. I don't have a zero entry in this. So I got to keep working on that one, or maybe I'll just abandon that way of assigning letter grades and stick with my if else statement. Here's an example where your input is a character. So now we read these alternatives as uh, possibilities for the input on the left, and then what should be returned on the right. So I put in the three meals that I ate the day that I made these notes. And if I input lunch into this, that comes back with tuna salad. I could change this to breakfast. And then it'll come back with uh, waffles instead. All right. Um, we've made the point that all of the numeric operations in R are by default component wise. Um, conditionals can be component wise as well. So if you type if else, well, no, no spaces, just as, as one single function name, uh, that's a vectorized version of an if-else statement. So the way it works is you give it a logical vector, and then it's going to return back a vector of the same size, and whatever you put into the second argument is what gets uh, returned wherever you have a true in your logical input, and then the third is whatever you get if there's a false in the logical input. So let's try running this. I'm going to generate 20 random numbers between uh, 1 to 100. So let's take a look at that. Okay, yep, no order to these, just 20 random numbers. I'm gonna run an if-else statement 
And what I'm going to put in for the logical part is whether the remainder is equal to zero after you divide by two or not. So we've worked with that concept a little bit. That's basically telling us wherever we have an even number, right? If you divide by two and there's no remainder, that's an even number. So wherever this is true, it's going to place the character uh, string even. Otherwise, wherever that's false, it's going to put the character string odd. And so if I run that, uh, it's very nice. So now I can see directly where I have the even numbers and where I have the odd ones. All right, I'll take any questions on that section before I go to the next one. All right, I'll keep on going. All right, so finally, let's talk about loops. It might feel weird for us to talk about loops on the last day that we're covering programming, because a lot of languages, this is one of the very first things you learn. That's because other languages are very reliant on for loops. Uh, they don't have vectorized component-wise calculations like R does, and so a for loop might be the only tool that you have for doing something iteratively. So that's why I've saved it till the end. Uh, and actually, I don't have for loops in my code very often. Um, I'll either use component-wise operations or a, a different alternative that I'll show you soon. Here's the basic template for a for loop. Uh, it's made up of two parts. First, there's a vector, and you have a variable that's going to iterate over that vector. It's going to take every value that's inside of it. And then the body of the for loop uh, is code that it'll run, but it runs it repeatedly for every different value of the variable inside that vector. So that's the most basic way of writing a for loop. And here's a common useful template. A lot of times you're using a for loop because you're running a calculation and you want to save that in something. So uh, before you actually start the for loop, go ahead and pre-allocate a vector. Go ahead and make something, you know, an empty box that as you do your calculations, you can put those results into it. So I'm calling that results vector. And I'm actually using the vector function to make an empty vector of a, a certain type and length. And then I'm going to iterate through that. And we'll explain what the sequence along function is about in, in a few minutes. Uh, I want to replace the i entry in the results vector, which is going to be empty anyway, with the result of the code that's inside the body of the for loop. Okay, let's look at examples and make sense of this. All right, so here, the vector that I'm iterating over is just the sequence one to five. So it's going to run the body of the for loop, first for a one, then for a two, then a three, then a four, and a five. And the body of this one's extremely simple. It's just printing the square of that number. So it's gonna square one, then two, three, four, and five. So I already know what I'm gonna get out of this. Uh, one, four, nine, 16, 25. Sure, so there's the, the output, uh, one output for each time that, that loop ran. All right, let's try a little more complicated example now. So this time I'm going to actually be saving uh, the result of the calculation inside. And so I'm going to initialize an empty vector. Now the vector that I'm making is just going to be a character or a string vector. So inside the vector function, I first put character saying that's the kind of vector I want you to pre-allocate. And how long should it be? Well, it should have an entry for every row of the MT cars data frame, which is built in. So let me show you, if you run that part, that just makes an empty vector. So isn't really doing anything meaningful, but I've got this placeholder for all the information that I want to save after I do the for loop. Okay, uh, let's look at this part. I'm calling sequence length in row of empty cars. Let's see what that does. That's just giving me a vector that goes by one from one to 32. So first I will be one, then two, all the way up to 32. Now here's what I want it to do for each one of those, those values. I've got a paste call and it's gonna kind of build a sentence for me. The, and then it's gonna look in row names uh, for that particular car, the ith car. So let's suppose it's looking at a Mazda RX-4. It'll say the Mazda RX-4 has, then it's gonna look at the cylinders variable, pull that out, cylinders pumping out. It'll find out how much horsepower it has it has that many horsepower. 
So let's try running this. Okay, it ran without error. Let me see what's inside car info now. Okay, and I'm getting statements like this. The Lotus Europa has four cylinders pumping out 113 horsepower. And I've got a vector of 32 strings. Um, give me that information for each car in the data set. All right, any questions yet? Makes sense so far? Okay, so I'm gonna uh, warn you about something which is not a common problem, but it's really confusing when it does happen. I use this function called sequence length and it might seem like there's a simpler way to do this. Why don't I just say going from one to however many rows I have? A data frame that has 32 rows. So just going from one to 32, that's the same output that I had a minute ago and that's simpler. So why did I call that sequence length? Well, here's why. So down here, I'm gonna make a, a slight change to this. I'm just going to make an assignment. So I'm using logical indexing. I'm referring to the cylinders variable. And then I'm looking to see where the number of cylinders is equal to seven. And everything is false, right? Because not in this data set, there's no seven cylinder cars. And then I'm using that as a row index and taking all the columns. So when I do that, well, that looks kind of funny, but that's an empty data frame, right? I retrieved the cars with seven cylinders. There's not any, and my, and my data frame is empty. Now, most of the time, if you're working directly with a data frame, there's no reason you would construct something like this. But what if this is done automatically, kind of hidden down deep inside some function or uh, routine of functions? And it's possible that you might get an empty subset of a data frame. That could happen. So this is actually not that far-fetched. I'm going to uh, assign that to the variable name mtdf. And then I'd like to simplify this part right here. Instead of constructing it again, just let me refer to it. All right, so before I run anything, look at this and think about what it should do. It's going through the rows of that empty data frame. And for every row, it's gonna say, it found a car with seven cylinders. If there's no rows, doesn't it seem like it's not gonna say anything? Because it's kind of going over well, an, an empty data frame, but watch this. The number of rows is zero. If I do a sequence that goes from one to zero, oh, that's not actually empty or null, is it? That's actually a sequence that goes from one then down to zero. So I is gonna be first one, then it's gonna be zero. So it actually prints that twice. And that's really confusing and not what we intend, right? So here's a safer way to, uh, to do that. That'll avoid things like this. If instead of going from one colon to however many rows, if I use something like sequence length and I pass in the number of rows, if that input is zero, that'll actually come back as something empty. So it's not gonna give me a sequence that goes one and then zero. It won't give me any sequence at all. So now if I try to run this, it prints nothing exactly like it should. All right, so the moral of this story is it's dangerous to have a construction like one to the number of rows in something or the number of columns in something. That'll work fine if you have a non-empty matrix or data frame. But if there's a possibility it could be empty, you should use something like sequence length. And then if there are no rows or columns, uh, you'll have an, uh, an empty sequence instead of one going from one to zero. Does that make sense? Okay, I'll keep on going. There's a couple of keywords, keywords you can use to control the flow of a loop. The keyword next, that'll force the next iteration of the loop. So if you want to abort one uh, step through the loop and jump immediately to the next one, 
insert a next. And then if you put break, that stops the loop entirely and the remainder of the loop is not completed. So here I built a loop that will go through uh, the letters of the alphabet and it's going to record all the consonants. So it'll ignore the vowels until the letter Q is reached. So first I pre-allocate an empty character vector so I can store things. 26 letters in the alphabet. So I'll go from I equal one to 26. And here I'm actually making use of a, uh, a built-in object in R, uh, just the lowercase letters that has the lowercase letters of the English alphabet. So what I'm telling it is if the current letter that it's looking at, letters I, if that's in this set, if it's either A, E, I, or U, that's a vowel, uh, not a consonant. I don't want to record that one. And so I'll use next. And so if it hits that next, it's just going to go to the next value of I. Otherwise, else if, if I reach the letter Q, I've decided that's where I'm going to stop this loop, uh, then it'll break and then it'll not do the for loop anymore at all. Otherwise, if it hasn't hit one of these two things, either making it next or making it break, then it'll record that. So let's run this. And notice that works exactly like we expected it to. I've got letters of the alphabet, but no vowels, and then it stopped at Q. It's not very often that I actually have to use the next and, and break. All right, the next loop is the while loop. This is more general. This continues executing body of the code until some condition is true, uh, and it'll stop only when that condition is false. So if I know ahead of time exactly how many times I need to run the loop, I'll probably use a for loop. If I don't know how many times I need to run it, and maybe I need to keep trying something until I find what I'm looking for, uh, then I'll use a while loop for that. The next and break also work for while loops. Um, I'll show you a simpler example here. So I wondered if I generate random numbers from one to 500, sample of size 10, um, is it possible for that data to have a greater standard deviation than a mean? So I, rather than think through this analytically, I decided I'll work through it uh, kind of by brute force. I'll have it generate samples randomly. And then whenever I have a greater standard deviation than the mean, I'll have it stop. So I start with a proceed. Uh, variable, which I'll set to be true. That way, when I try to run the beginning of the while loop, that variable will be true and it'll at least begin the loop. I was also curious how many times it would have to try until it found a uh, sample that met those conditions. So I'm initializing a variable count at zero, and that's going to be incremented each time inside the loop. Okay, so let's look at the body of the loop. It's going to create a sample. I'll actually run the inside of the loop once. Okay, there's a sample of 10 numbers, one to 500. I look and see if the mean is greater than the standard deviation. So the mean of this is 193, standard deviation 121. In this case, that's going to evaluate to true. So proceed is going to remain true. And that means it's gonna keep on going. I haven't found the condition I was looking for yet. So it keeps looking. Okay, let me actually run the loop. It finishes very quickly and let's take a look. How many times did it have to try before it found a sample that worked? 55 times. Okay, any questions there? All right, I'll keep on going. There's also a repeat loop. Uh, this one's even more general than a while. It repeats the body until break is reached. That's one that I've actually never had a reason to use, uh, and I won't give any examples of it here. Uh, the replicate function, this one I do use occasionally, this one's nice. It evaluates the same code a fixed number of times, and then it saves the results to a list or array. So kind of like a for loop, but if your variable doesn't need to change, uh, then you can use the replicate. Now for the output to be interesting, there's gonna be some randomization aspect to it. Otherwise, it's just doing the exact same thing deterministically over and over, uh, and that's not interesting. This is useful for repeated sampling and illustrating statistical properties. So for this example, let me start from the inside of this. Our poise, that'll generate a random sample of Poisson random, random numbers. Okay, so there's my random sample from a Poisson distribution. 
I can have it calculate the mean of that. And this time the mean was 4.45. Well, I would like it to repeat that part that's highlighted right now a hundred times. So I can get back a hundred different averages from a random sample from a Poisson distribution. So if I run that, okay, that's replicated that code a hundred times. I've got a hundred different observations of the sample mean. I can save those and make a histogram. And then I can quickly illustrate uh, the central limit theorem. Does it really matter what kind of distribution we're sampling from? Uh, if we take independent random samples, the uh, distribution of the sample mean uh, converges, approaches a normal distribution. Okay, so that's the end of that section. Uh, in this next se section, I'm gonna show you a different way of iterating, not using loops. So like I said, even though for loops show up a lot, especially in other languages, I rarely use them in R uh, because if my task is simple, I can use component-wise vectorized calculations, which are shorter and faster to write, and I find them more elegant as well. But if the task is complicated, I use something called functional iteration, where I define a function that does the work that I want to be done, and then I have uh, something apply that function to every row or perhaps column of a data frame or matrix. So this is something that's harder to learn than loops, uh, but once you know it, I think it's better for these reasons. They're less verbose. I don't have to type as much uh, to get it out. I find them easier to read and then rephrase the ideas in natural language. One thing that I don't like about loops, they clutter up your environment. Have you noticed that uh, as I'm running these loops, mostly over I, it's really common to use I as that index variable. Uh, that shows up here in my environment. Any of the work that's done inside the loop does show up in the environment. And so whatever happened the last time I ran the loop, that's still there. And it's kind of just making things messy. And then the fourth advantage is that uh, I don't have to pre-allocate things. I don't have to go ahead and construct an empty vector to be filled in because this code will do that for me in the background. So a little bit harder to learn, but I definitely think it's worth, worth the investment. In base R, there's the apply family of functions, and I'll show two examples of that. And then I'll show one example of the map family of functions uh, in the per library, which does basically the same thing, but uh, it is a little bit, a little bit nicer and they uh, fit into a larger framework well. So I'm gonna repeat the first two for loops that we did in the functional style. Let's go and look at the code for this. All right, so first I'm gonna use uh, L apply. That L at the beginning stands for list. This will let me iterate over a vector or list and then apply the same uh, function to each part of that. So first I put in what the vector or list I wanna iterate over is. And I'm just putting in one to five right now. And then I want it to print the square of that number. And there's not a built-in function for uh, squaring something and printing that. So, I can define my own on the fly. I'm defining a function of the variable i, and all it has to do is take i, square it, and then print it. So that's called an anonymous function because I'm not actually giving a name to this function. I'm just defining it as I go. And because it's so brief, that's really not a problem. So let me run that and see what my variable out is. Okay, it's constructed a list which has the results of each time that function was run a one, and then a four, a nine, a 16, and a 25. I'd say the only bad thing about this is it returns a list by default. And in this case, just an ordinary numeric vector would be fine, but I can use as.numeric on that. And then I can get an ordinary numeric vector. All right, so does that make sense? You put in what you want it to apply it to and then the function that should be applied. Here, this is doing the same thing, but it's using a function out of the, uh, the per library. Um, one of the advantages over this, you can append the kind of output, the type that you want at the name of the, the map function. And so I don't have to take it from a list, convert it to a number. It'll automatically give me a double, which is one of the numeric types. So if I run that, I can see how it was printing as it went through. 
And then I can also see the final output. Okay, let's do the second for loop example again, but in the functional style. So I actually ran into a little problem when I ran this one. Uh, let's go back and look at the first example of, of this that we did. Okay, so right here, you notice how I'm referring to a row name of, of a data frame. We've also learned, and you've seen in homework, that sometimes row names can be dropped, right? Attributes can be dropped. So the first time I tried to run this, uh, I tried to use an apply function. And this didn't work because as it looked at it row by row, kind of like it would for, for a for loop, uh, it was dropping attributes. It was dropping the row name and that didn't work. So that's one of the reasons I don't actually like the concept of a row name very much, uh, especially not for storing information that's really important to a problem. So the very first thing I did is I'm creating a new variable in the data frame called model, and I'm just assigning that to the row names. So I'm just taking the row names kind of from outside the data frame and putting them on the inside. So let's check that. I've created a variable called model, and then I can see that, yeah, that ends up being the last variable in the data frame. Okay, now that I've done that, let me write a function that I'll call summarize engine. It takes in an X, which is really going to be a row from the NT cars data frame, and it just pastes together the information. The model has this many cylinders pumping out this much horsepower. So now I've got a function that does the work that I want to do. Let me apply it to the empty cars data frame. And here, this one, the one means I want it to go row by row. If for some reason I wanted a, uh, one of these functions to go column by column, then I would put in a two there. And then summarize engine is the function that I want to run. And okay, and there I go. Now I've got very similar output as I, as I had before. All right, let me show you one more example. This one's not in the notes, but I put this together real quick before class because uh, I noticed in the homework, some people were, go ahead and using for loops, even though they hadn't been introduced, uh, which is fine, but they were getting the standard deviation of every column of a matrix with the for loop. That works, but let me show you the functional iteration way of doing it. Here I'm defining a five by three matrix. Getting something like column means, there's a built-in function for that. I just run call means. There's not a built-in function called uh, call SD or, or call standard deviation. But if I apply 2x going column by column, the standard deviation function, that does it for me. That's actually really nice and quick. Okay, that makes sense. Questions there. All right, let's go on to the next section. Function composition. So class is getting more complicated and often we're not just applying one function at a time, but several functions and we might have some indexing mixed in there. Uh, and these mixes of function calls and indexing calls can get kind of complicated. So what's a, a good systematic way of performing these uh, complicated, uh, complicated operations? There's a few, let me show you three different strategies. The first is what we've already done, which is called nesting. Um, kind of build functions from, I think of them from the inside out. So you do one operation, pass it into another function, pass it into another one, and then it grows outward. Suppose I want the average horsepower of cars with four cylinders. Here's how I could break that down and, and then build it back up. Start with the data frame. Let's refer to the cylinders variable of this. Okay, extracting just out the cylinders right now. I only want the cars that have four cylinders. So let me construct a logical that tells me where I have four cylinders. So wherever I see a true there, those are the rows representing a four cylinder car. I'm gonna use that as an index on the horsepower variable. So I'm kind of going back to my data frame, looking at the horsepower variable. 
but only picking out the ones where I've got four cylinders. So there's the horsepower of the four cylinder cars. And then finally, that's nested inside the mean function. Okay, so yeah, that, that construction works well if you have a small number of compositions, but it gets, gets messy quickly. Another thing you can do, and I see this in people's homework solutions as well, is you can define intermediate variables. Uh, just do one operation at a time, save the result of that. Do the next one, save the result of that. Um, for beginners, this is probably the easiest. Uh, one thing I don't like about it, each one of these intermedi intermediate variables clutters up the environment. Um, um, it's also tricky to come up with a lot of good variable names for these and keep them distinct from each other. But let's try it. Two uh, sub options for this. One is to define distinct intermediate values. So first, let me just see where are the cars that have four cylinders. I'll save that as four sill logical. Let me now use that as an index on the car's uh, horsepower. So I'll get the horsepower of the four cylinder cars. Take that as I go along. And then I can take the mean of that. Okay, so it breaks it down into smaller steps and a little bit easier to follow along with. Another thing you can do, if you don't wanna to have to worry about coming up with a unique name for each one of these intermediate variables, just overwrite the previous variable name. So first I'll get the logical vector where I have four cylinders. Then I'll use that to get the horsepower of those cars. And then finally, I'll take the average of that. It doesn't clutter up the environment as much, but I actually, I don't like this way of doing it because I have to think about output differently as I go through it. First, it's a logical vector, then it's a numeric vector, and then finally, it's just a single number. Um, for this to work well, you always have to start at the beginning. If you have a mistake in the middle and you try to fix that mistake and then go from there, uh, that can be tricky. You can uh, overwrite that with something that you're really not intending. So I, I use that strategy very rarely. All right, and finally, the last one, uh, uh, the pipe. The pipe is not something that you see in all programming languages. Some of them do, ha do have it. R didn't, did not have one by default for a long time, and you had to use a package to, to load it. Um, and actually, quite recently, just within the last few months, they've added a native pipe into R. But I'll continue using the one from uh, a package called the Magritter package. So this has a keyboard shortcut. If you do Control-Shift-M, it'll put the pipe operator, which is that sequence of symbols there. Uh, percent greater than percent. So this is probably best explained by example. So let me try using the pipe down here. I'm starting with the data frame and I'm pulling out the horsepower variable. And then I've got the pipe symbol. What this does, it takes the result on the left-hand side, passes that into the next function as the first argument. So next I'll pick up uh, the second line of the pipe. This is taking that horsepower and taking the subset of that where the cars have four cylinders. So I recognize that vector by now. There's the horsepower of the four cylinder cars. I take that vector and I pass that into the mean function. I pipe it again. And then I get my answer that way. I like the pipe a lot because uh, it's kind of like working from the inside out but you're doing it from a, in a top to bottom kind of way where I can see the first thing that I'm doing then my next operation then my next operation. It's a lot easier for me to uh, understand and read sequentially. I'm taking the horsepower, taking the subset where the cars have four cylinders and then taking the average. Now in the background, it really is just taking things and putting it as the argument into something else. So it's equivalent to this line. These two lines are really doing exactly the same thing but I find the top one a little bit easier to understand. Um, I'm gonna skip that example. That's just showing something uh, kind of extra you can do with the pipe. Uh, but I don't think it's worth using our, our class time on that. All right, any questions on uh, the pipe, nesting or intermediate variables?
All right, I'll keep on going. Next topic is called signaling conditions. Uh, this one's advanced, I'm only gonna cover it lightly. Um, but you've noticed as you run R functions, sometimes if you use it in an unintended way, you'll get an error or a warning. Let me show you how you can uh, create those yourself, either for the, the benefit of other people who'll be using your code or maybe for yourself at a later point in time. The first and strongest kind of signal is an error. Use this one when something is fatally wrong and your function cannot continue. Insert the stop function somewhere inside your function wherever you want it to throw the error. And then the argument of that function will be the message that should be returned. All right, so let's take a look at this. Um, I took the previous idea of looking at the average horsepower for a certain number of cylinders, of cylinders and I turned it into a function. So I put in numsil, it'll take horsepower, subset according to that number of cylinders and then calculate the mean. So let's experiment with this a little bit. If I try it on uh, four cylinders, that works just fine. And if I look at eight cylinder cars, that'll work too. What if I try this on seven cylinder cars? We've already found out there are no cars with seven cylinders in the data set, right? Okay, I try that and it comes back as uh, not a number. All right, so this doesn't actually throw an error, but if somebody's using this function, we they really don't have any idea why they got a not a number output, right? Maybe we can improve this by putting a stop call inside here. So this is the same function, but I've added an if statement. All right, and let's look and see what the logical variable that begins this if statement is. It's looking at the cylinder variable, looking to see uh, which ones have the number of inputted syllable, cylinders, and then it's summing that. If that sum is equal to zero, we know that we're looking at an empty subset of the vehicles, and so we have it throw uh, an error. Stop, no cars have the given number of, of cylinders. Otherwise, if it doesn't get hit by that if statement, it'll run the rest of the code like it would normally. So let's try this. First, I'm going to try it on something that I know works. I tried on a four-cylinder car, tried on a six-cylinder car. Let me try it on a seven-cylinder car. Okay, that if statement intercepted the, the flow of the program. Uh, it hit the stop function, it returns the error, and, and we, we see what's wrong. No cars have the given number of cylinders. All right, that's the first and strongest kind of signal. The second kind is a warning. Warnings are milder. Uh, they don't actually halt the execution. These are useful when your function detects um, Something that isn't technically an error and it can keep going, but it's probably something unintended. And you want to, well, just warn the user about this. So I was curious, if I called my function, what if I put in a character as a number of cylinders instead of a number? All right, it still works. It automatically coerced it, but that's kind of kind of the goofy thing to do, right? Maybe we should warn the user that they should check their data types. Maybe they're, they're probably not intending to pass in a number for this. So I took the uh, same function as before, but I put in an if statement right here. It checks to see if the number of cylinders is numeric, like it should be, uh, but then it negates it. So if it's something that's not a number, it comes back with this warning. The number of cylinders is not a number, check your data types, and then it does the coercion for the user. The num cylinders gets turned into a number. All right, so let's try using this. If I try it on numbers, no warnings, everything works just fine. If I try to pass in a character, it still ran and we still got the output, but we get the warning message that what we passed in was not a number. All right, uh, this makes sense, questions so far? Okay. Uh, the last kind of uh, signal is just a message. These are very neutral. Uh, they don't indicate something is going wrong, like a warning or, or an error. They just give information back. So I decided I would write a function that used a message to uh, update 
the user on the progress of the function. I purposely made something that would take a long time to run and I'll use messages to say you're 25% of the way through or 50% of the way through. All right, so let's look at the function that I made. Uh, I give it a number X and it's gonna start with a variable numbers which just starts off as zero and then something called quarterly progress which also starts out as zero. And then I've got a for loop that's going from one to however long, uh, long X is. Now I'm doing something which is really terrible programming practice here. You should never do something like this. It's bad code. I'm doing it on purpose because I want slow inefficient code. What this is doing is it's growing the numbers vector one at a time. So it's taking the number one and then combining it with the number two, then taking the vector one and two and combining it with the number three. This is really slow and it's bad on the computer's uh, memory, it uses up a lot of RAM because it's doing something like this. Imagine I've got a classroom that's gonna have 20 students in it, but first I just find a classroom that has one desk. Well, the first student shows up, they take that desk, and the second student comes in. Well, now we need more desks, so we go to a classroom that has two desks in it. Then the third student comes in, we have to change to another classroom that has three desks in it. This is stupid. Why shouldn't I just pick a classroom at the beginning that has 20 desks in it? Uh, that would be like pre-allocating. I should pre-allocate all of these numbers uh, at the beginning at once, but I'm purposefully growing it one at a time so it'll be slow. Okay, and then the, the point of this was to show how the message works. So what I'm doing is finding out uh, what proportion of the way through the numbers this is. And every time it passes uh, another 25%, it just prints out a message that says the function is this percent complete. All right, so I've got my function ready. Let me run it on 100,000. And it's taken a few minutes to complete and I can see every 25% of the way, this is coming back with a message. And as that vector gets longer and longer and longer, it's taking more and more memory and time for it to add one more thing to it and recreate another uh, version of it. So the first quarter went by really quick and it took longer and longer and longer as we went through. And also for the math people, uh, you know that there's a really simple way of calculating that, right? N times N plus one over two. Yeah. Okay, this is our last section, right? Uh, yes, debugging. So now that we've started writing functions to do our work, it's a little bit hard to figure out the source of an error inside a function uh, because functions work inside their own environments, right? You can't look in the environment, you can't use your console to see what the values are. So you um, have to be more careful about figuring out what's going wrong inside a function. I'm gonna give you some general advice on uh, how to prevent errors in your functions, but then I'll show you some specific tools for uh, investigating when something does go wrong. First, always try to start small. Don't try to tackle a complicated problem uh, in one large messy function. Build it up piece by piece. Sometimes I'll write a function which itself calls other functions that do subtasks. So get it to do one simple thing, get that working. Now I'll use that to do something a little bit more complicated, get that part working, build it up slowly. All right, now a specific strategy that you can use, uh, use the traceback function. So if your function is calling other functions, and maybe that one's calling even more functions, it can be hard to know where the error is happening. Maybe the reason for the error is kind of high up, but that's not realized. It doesn't actually cause a problem until much deeper down. The traceback function shows the sequence of calls. Um, and actually, a lot of times, our studio will give you this by default, and we'll see that in an example in just a moment. Second strategy is, if this is a function that you are writing yourself, uh, send some output from inside the function to, to the console. Insert print uh, cat, which will paste and print simultaneously for you, or messages uh, at key points in the code so you can see how things are progressing and help you identify where the error is. And then once you fix it, you can remove these so it doesn't clutter up your console. Uh, and the third strategy, and this is the, the biggest one, the nuclear option, 
uh, step inside the function, actually go into the environment that's created when the function is called. And then you can expect the objects in there, make sure they are what you uh, think they're supposed to be. And there's a couple of ways of doing this. You can insert the browser command at the place inside the function where you would like to step into it and begin inspecting what's going on. We'll use that strategy. Um, there's another way you can do this inside RStudio, but I haven't had great luck with that. Sometimes it crashes when I use it. So I'll just show you the, the first way of doing it. So we're gonna practice these on a function that I wrote. Uh, let's try to understand what the function does. And this function is going to throw an error. Let's try to use these uh, three strategies to figure out where the error is happening and how we might prevent it. So this function is called standardized resample. The point of it is it's going to sample with replacement uh, of a specified size from a uh, column of a, of a data frame. So I pass in the data frame, the name of the column that I wanted to sample from, and then uh, how big I want the sample to be. So the first thing it does is figures out what should the indices be for the rows that it's going to sample from. And I wrote this uh, with the pipe. So let's try to understand what's going on here. It's gonna take the data frame. It's going to pass that into in row to find out how many rows it has. It's going to pass that into sequence length, which will make a sequence from, from one to however many rows it has, but it's safe. And if there's no rows, if it happens to be empty, uh, then it'll give us back something, something empty like we would want. And then it's going to sample from that with replacement uh, of the, the given size. All right, that's all really just one statement. This function looks complicated, but it's really just doing two things. Uh, the first one, the line on 423 really just being one expression. Then it'll create a variable resample. It's gonna take the data frame and look in the rows that it just constructed. And then it's gonna look at the column name that's input. It's going to scale this and then it's gonna create a histogram out of it. Now in the notes that I posted, uh, I had it a little bit different. Uh, first it was, actually, I think I can show here. In the first version of this, I had it make a frequency table and make a bar plot. Um, I decided this would work better with just a simple histogram. So if you want to follow along with me, you can make that same change. All right, so let's try running this function. First, I'm going to run it on MT cars with the horsepower variable, and I want it to resample 5,000 times. Okay, so I've got my histogram down there. Let me run this again and we'll see the random nature of this. All right, let me try running the same function on the cylinder variable with only a sample of size three. All right, so this first time I ran it, I get an error, an invalid number of breaks. Let me run it a few more times just to show Sometimes this works. I'm getting a very simple histogram over there on the right, but most of the time it works, right? But every now and then I get this error. Let's try using these debugging tools to figure out where the problem is. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is, remember there's the traceback function. I could type it in the console and call it, but our studio will give it to you automatically right here. You see that? I hit show traceback. And I would say, uh, read this from the bottom up. So we made the function call standardized resample. Then it called uh, this part right here, the right-hand side of the assignment on line 427. So this tells me one thing, the problem happened somewhere inside uh, this expression. The first part on line 423, it didn't actually throw the error there. Now that doesn't mean the source of the error is in online 423 somewhere. That could still be the root of the problem, but the error is actually getting thrown somewhere inside here. All right, now we look at the, the third one, hist. So actually we now know it was able to run things fine until right here. Once it hit the hist function, that's when the error is actually thrown. 
Now, at that point, it starts going inside the hist function, and that's kind of out of our control. We didn't write that. We're going to assume that our programmers have not made a, uh, a buggy function. We need to figure out what's happening before we call the hist function that's making this go bad. Okay, so traceback has helped a little bit. We've, able, we've been able to figure out that it actually is throwing the error at the, the call to hist. All right, uh, I think the next thing I'd like to do is, I'd like to send some output to the console. So I'm gonna do this. I'm going to comment the hist part. I'm gonna replace that with print. So I've got the print at the end of this pipe sequence. And so now my function is not actually gonna to try to make the histogram, but after it scales the variable, it'll print the result of that. And maybe I'll notice something funny going on. Since I've made a change to my function, let me rerun the line that defines it. And let's run line 435 until we see something that looks weird. Okay, so there it took a sample of size three of cylinders. It scaled it. Nothing looks unusual there, right? Okay, I didn't hit a problem that time. And that time it looks okay. All right, this looks different because I have uh, integers, but I don't actually see a problem with that yet. Let's keep on going. Might take a little while to reproduce the problem. Okay, what's going on here? I've got not a number of values when I tried to scale things. Can anybody figure out the problem at this point? You got a guess, Mercy? Well, it's okay if you don't. We'll uh, we'll keep investigating this, but we've we sort of identified what part of the problem is. Uh, when we're scaling this, I'm getting not a numbers, and look at my scale attribute. That's my, those are standard deviations, right? Standard deviation is zero. What does it mean if standard deviation is zero? Hmm. I'm going to do this. I'm going to adjust my function some more. I'm going to not have it print right now. Uh, and I'm gonna have the pipe stop after scale. So I'm not gonna pass this, the result of that into anything else. But I prepared this uh, earlier. Here's a little segment of code that I'm going to bring in and execute. All right, so let's look at this, what this is gonna do. First, I call the cat function that concatenates and prints. So all this is doing is kind of building a little piece of information for me to look at. A variable resample, which is taking that part of the data frame and scaling. I'm gonna say variable resample is, and then it'll actually print that out. And I'm gonna have it do something else. Uh, I know that sometimes this can be not a number. If it is not a number, I wanted to print out something uh, extra. I then wanted to say what the row indices are, and maybe that'll help me start to, to pinpoint the problem. Okay, so I'm gonna rerun the function. Okay, so this time we got the problem uh, immediately. The variable resample does have not a number, and the row indices are 22, 24, and 25. So let me do this, let me look at my, empty cars. Let me look at rows 22, 24, and 25. In particular, we're trying to scale the cylinder variable, right? Let's look at the cylinder variable. You see the problem now? There's no variation, yeah. With this tiny, it's kind of a stupidly small sample of size three. Every now and then we're getting three cars that all have the same number of cylinders. So when it tries to standardize this, 
and it calculates the standard deviation, that's zero. It's dividing by zero. So we've identified the source of the problem now, right? Now, the more difficult question is, how do we fix it? How do we keep this from happening? Any suggestions there before I show what I would do? I'm gonna do this. In between my first expression, which gets the row indices, and then the second one, which actually scales things and makes the histogram, let me put in an if statement. If, I'm gonna take this part of the data frame that it's about to extract, Let me wrap that inside the standard deviation function. If that standard deviation is zero, we got a problem, right? I could have it give a warning, uh, or I guess an error would be more appropriate since it's gonna run into an error soon anyway. But I think what I would like to do, uh, if the standard deviation is zero, I would like for it to go back and uh, generate a new sample for me. I'd like it to get new row indices. So I'm gonna use a while loop for this. I don't know how many times I'm gonna have to try until I get row indices that give me a non-trivial part of the data frame when I, and I don't have the standard deviation being equal to zero. Standard deviation being equal to zero. So let me do this. I'm gonna start with a uh, logical variable proceed equal to true. And I want this while loop to run while proceed is true. So inside the while loop, I'm gonna put the part that calculates the row indices and this check to see if the standard deviation of cylinders is zero. And actually, I think I want to change this a little bit. If the standard deviation is equal to zero, I want it to keep going. I want the, the while loop to, to continue. When it's not equal to zero, that's when I can actually stop, right? If the standard deviation is not equal to zero, then we're not going to have that problem with scaling. Then it can stop generating uh, row indices. All right, uh, I should have fixed the problem now, so I'm going to remove this part down here. Kind of clean up my function some. I don't think I'll need the print anymore. And after it scales, since I think things are gonna be working now, I would like it to then go ahead and produce the, the histogram. Okay, uh, I'll show you a little tip here. While I've been working on this function and inserting things and deleting stuff, my formatting's got a little messy, right? Like my spacing and my tabs are not optimal. This isn't written down in the notes, but here's a nice uh, shortcut. If you highlight a section of R code and you hit Control Shift A, that will automatically format it for you. So with that highlighted, I do Control Shift A. It was kind of a subtle change, but it, it fixed some of my spacing. And so now it's easier to read again. Okay, uh, let's try running this. Let's see if it works now. Redefine the function. I'll have to run it several times because the error was somewhat rare, but I've run this 30 or 40 times now. I'm not seeing that error come up anymore. I think we fixed it. I think that function is, is fine now. Okay. Um, now I was able to diagnose and fix this problem just by using uh, traceback to kind of narrow it down. And then by using messages to print things and see where the problem is. Let me show you how you might use the browser function. So let me put the browser function right here. I'll insert a call to browser. 
I made a change, so I redefined my function. So now let me run it. Okay, and we can see my interface has kind of changed a little bit. Up here, uh, my script or my R markdown file, uh, that's in a different tab. It's opened up a new one, which just has my, my function, standardized resample. I can see that there's a green arrow pointing at line 13. That's where I put the browser function, and that's where we are inside the, the function right now. Now, normally, when you run a function, you can't see what's in the environment, but look up here. Can you see how my environment that I'm looking at actually is the one that's inside the function, standardized resample? Yeah, so uh, DF, a data frame, has been passed in when we called this. So if I go to my console and I hit DF, I can actually see that. that that's the cars, the empty cars data frame. Um, if I want to know what the size that's been passed into this function is, I can see that here. Now, because we stopped it at line 13, it's already run this while loop, going from lines three to 12. So it's already come up with row indices. Let's check those out. And then I can even use these to build up some of the things that are about to be called. So uh, maybe I'm wondering what's gonna happen right here when it uses those to pick out rows of the data frame and then call name to pick out a column. Let me try that. All right, and I can see that this set of cars has cylinders, uh, cylinder values four, eight, and four. And they're, and they're not all identical to each other. Here, I've got a few uh, new options. The one that I use the most is next. Uh, this lets you step through this line by line. So I hit next and it's going and it's about ready to call the variable resample line. I can let that run. And at that point, uh, the function is done. It's completed without error. It brings me out of debugging mode and brings me back to um, ordinary R, my regular markdown file and the console. So it's a tricky tool to learn how to use, but it's really powerful. Uh, whenever I have the most difficult kinds of bugs, I'm having a hard time figuring out what's going on. I'll put browser, I'll step inside and I'll eventually realize, oh, I thought this was gonna work this way. It's actually working this other way. And then I can start working on a solution from there. Uh, there's a couple more advanced tools. Uh, there's a debug function, trace and recover. Those are more complicated. Hopefully we'll never have problems so difficult that we need to use those. All right, any final questions out of lecture six? All right, so as things are getting more complicated, I'm only going to give you one homework problem. Uh, but I think this is the most difficult one that you've seen up until now. And this is meant to be something that brings together kind of a lot of the skills that we've learned uh, in the course up until here. So I want you to load the mass library and the CARS 93 data set. And let's suppose that there's a, a auto service center and they're charging $40 to replace a spark plug. And there's one spark plug for each of the cylinders of a car. They're gonna charge $30 for uh, every liter of oil or a liter of displacement in the engine to be replaced. Uh, and then they're gonna charge $2 per inch to vacuum the, the rear seat. And the variables you need are cylinders, engine size, and rear seat room. So you're the manager of a used car lot and your inventory is contained in the Cars 93 data frame. You need to calculate the cost of having your entire lot of cars serviced before they can re be resold. So if you are an undergrad, I'd like you to solve this with a, a for loop. Go over the rows of the data frame and find the total cost. There's a couple of things that require careful handling. Uh, one, there is a car that has a rotary engine, so it has no cylinders and it only has one spark plug. You gotta treat that one separately. There are a handful of two-seater cars that don't have a back seat, so there's no vacuuming cost. Uh, I would say probably use an if statement to check for those things and handle those as, as they come up. If you're a grad student, then I'd like you to do the for loop solution, but then I'd like you to also come up with a solution using only component wise calculations. So without any loops, just using logical vectors uh, and logical indexing, can you solve this problem? 
and come up with the same solution. Now there is that third kind of iteration of the apply family of functions. I'm gonna let that one be a bonus. And that can be a bonus either for the undergrads or the grad students. If you can do all three of those, like I did in my key, um, I'll be impressed and you'll be ready to go on to the next part of the class.